Okay. And I'm going to share my screen. And let me pop up my, these are the presentation slides. So I want to welcome everybody. Um, interesting. There's the view I want. Yeah. Okay. I want to be able to see you folks on the side of the screen while I'm talking. That's good. That way, if somebody asks a question, I, I can sort of see you and respond. Uh -huh. Okay. Question? Excuse me, Tom. Is there a way I can get my photo up there? Or is it going to stay blank? What? Can't make you out. There's kind of an echo from your microphone. Speak a little more slowly. Maybe I can I can pick oh, it up. Okay. I I was just questioning why you have um, photos of some people on the screen and myself and Joe are not on there. How do we get our pictures up there? Uh, you need to turn on your video camera. There's an icon in the lower left corner of the Zoom window. And if it's got an X through it, your video is off. I say, okay, I'm gonna try it. Like that to turn it on. We always have to give lessons on Zoom when we first get started here. <laughs> Let me see if that worked for uh, I still don't see her. Let's see, I think I see Fred and Janet Bailey here twice. Nope, maybe that Janet and Lou. Oh, that's Bailey's and Mosley's. Bailey and Mosley's, yeah. Two Janets, two Janets. Yep, it's all right. Well, let me get on with the presentation. Uh, we can hear, if, if we can't get your picture, we can still hear you. So um, last time the club did a Quicken class of any kind was 2008. So it's been 12 years. I could not hear that very well. That's Janet Bailey. What? What's your question, Janet? I didn't have one. I'm sorry. Oh, I need right. to go. Your your picture lit up. That means I'm hearing. Uh, I right? just came. I just came on. That's probably okay. why. That could be. Well, anyway, uh, I thought it would be interesting. We're getting into the season. Uh, where end of year record keeping is important. You've got to be getting ready to do your taxes the beginning of next year, all that stuff. And uh, it's the shopping season too. And a lot of transactions are going by. Yeah. So, uh, okay. uh, I thought it would be good anyway to maybe uh, take a shot at running through the latest version of Quicken. Now, my, my orientation here was for beginners. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you aren't really beginners with Quicken in spite of that. So maybe one of my first questions is uh, what exactly uh, are people interested in hearing about at this point? I can adjust a little bit as we go. Uh, I've got slides, but a lot of what I'm going to do is just use Quicken and demonstrate things and talk as we go. Because um, it's it's much easier, I think, to see it visually than just look at a bunch of bullet slides. So um, anybody have anything they're really dying to hear about? And. Not not too exotic. I mean, if you if you want. Well, to I mentioned. Talk. Go ahead, Joe. No, I just I, I mentioned to you once before that uh, I'm I'm carrying junk from the early '90s on uh, on my quick. Okay. And I've never 
I've never closed it out and, and restarted it uh, well, and saved the old stuff. A, so I don't have a slide on it, but I actually did go dig out where to do it in this version of Quicken. So I'll okay. I'll I'll show you where to do it. I haven't tried it yet because uh, before before you do the close, you want to make sure you've made a copy of your Quicken database safely. Yeah. Just in case things don't go as planned. All right, that's a good one. Anything else? Yeah, Tom, I have a question. Sure. Um, I I used to use the old Quicken, and I had was forced to buy the new Quicken, and now it keeps wanting to go to the internet and upload all my information, and I don't want it to. Is there a way to tell it to stop doing that? Should be. Why, I mean, I, I don't let upload? it. I don't let it go. I don't let it go into upload, but it still pops up every time asking me, you know, to do it. And I, is this I don't. Like, is it wanting to back up your data to the Quicken it, Cloud or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I, that I think there are settings. I'm going to walk us through the menus real quick, but. Uh, I think you can control the backup stuff, including the cloud. Okay. By changing the settings. Okay, thank I'll you. I'll show you where it is, but if, if I try to do every setting, that'll take two hours. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Good. All right, last chance. Okay, so uh, basically what we'll do, where to get Quicken, that's, that's easy. Why use it is pretty obvious, but we'll kind of highlight some of the main reasons. Uh, I'm going to use uh, John and Mary Smith is a fictitious couple who I fabricated years ago for my tax classes. And uh, I brought them back for this because we need to have some conceptual set of people in order to set this up. I didn't want to use our own personal data in, in front of the world um, for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, so I completely made up a Quicken database based on John and Mary Smith. We can put transactions into that as much as we want, no problems. So then we'll we'll get into, you know, how do you set Quicken up, particularly if you're just getting started creating a new database. And then out of that, how do you set up various accounts and categories, uh, entering transactions? And I, I sort of divided it between cash flow types of transactions and then a little bit about investment and asset type transactions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about reconciling because uh, if you just let your Quicken accounts run, pretty soon you're gonna be out of sync with your bank, your broker and everybody else. Uh, we'll spend some time on reports and graphs and then uh, making backups because uh, bookkeeping is a lot of work and you'd hate after <laughs> the end of the year comes, you're just ready to fire up TurboTax or H&R Block and all of a sudden something happens to your hard drive and all your data is gone. You know, so like everything else, you need to make backups and uh, we'll talk about how Quicken does that. All right, if that seems like a reasonable program, uh, let's just dive in. Uh, point to make, uh, Quicken used to be a product of Intuit software. They got spun off a few years ago, and it's now a separate company. And uh, if you're interested in the review, I've got a link there. Uh, Quicken Deluxe is the version we're going to look at today. And it's really quite nice. It does an amazing amount of stuff. Uh, the going rate these days, I've, I've got a web. Let's see. Let me get that up for a second. I just put in a Google Quicken Deluxe 2020. Uh, if you rush out right now, you can buy it at Office Depot for $31.19. They're having the end of year sales. 
uh, since a subscription now, since it is a subscription, uh, if they update to Quicken 2021, which typically happens early in the new year, uh, as a subscriber, you automatically get the updates. Uh, anyway, you can, you can shop around and buy it that way. Question there, that's Barb? No? Okay. Let me uh, minimize that and get back to my PowerPoints. Uh, typically, when you buy it now, you actually download it from the Quicken website. You run the installer. Crazy. Uh, Quicken, if you decide after you had it for a year, you don't need the uh, particularly the ability to download transactions and you don't care about uh, tech support, you can let the subscription lapse and the program will continue to work as a, a bookkeeping software program. But it's the downloading feature, uh, getting all your transactions electronically from the web that really makes life bearable if you're really seriously trying to do all your bookkeeping with the program. Because otherwise, uh, you're typing in mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of transactions. And the likelihood that you get them all correct is, is not high at that point. You can go to the Quicken website, shop there and buy it. But generally, at least the first year buying at one of the retail outlets, uh, you get better prices. So. Um, these handouts, by the way, are online on the Computer Club website, so don't feel like you have to make notes. Um, do I need to show everybody how to do that? Or probably not, huh? Okay. So why use Quicken? I mean, you could you could actually just get a big notebook and do all your bookkeeping on paper if you want to. Uh, there are still probably free accounting software packages. I know if you're a Linux person, you can go get an open source dual entry accounting system, very powerful, but of course it doesn't do any downloading or anything. So it's all manual entry at that point. So the big reason you're uh, keeping track of what you own you're keeping track of uh, cash in and cash out, what you spend, what you receive, wages, dividends, the whole bit. Uh, Quicken keeps track of all the tax related items. Uh, most of the default categories in Quicken already have been tagged as tax related or not. Uh, but as you set up categories, you may want to uh, add whether those are taxable or not. And you, you can even specify what IRS uh, form and line they go to. Um, that can be nice because if you do that very meticulously, you can actually import from Quicken right into one of the tax programs. And uh, both H&R Block and TurboTax can do that. Uh, again, the big thing is electronic downloads of banking, investments, credit card, all the various uh, accounts that you keep. You can link them up to Quicken. Uh, and then typically once a month, you'll, you'll go download everything from all of your various financial providers. Uh, before it goes in, you actually get a chance to validate what was downloaded make sure it looks right. And you can item by item decide whether to let it come into your Quicken database or not. Um, again, I can't actually demo that too well because I'm using John and Mary who are not real. <laughs> so all the accounts I have in there are, are not able to go to real live accounts. The other thing that Quicken's nice for is you can do financial planning uh, and tracking. Uh, you can do your budgeting things. 
I believe it can do some level of risk analysis for you. Uh, the other thing, if you're uh, particularly running, say, a small business, or uh, in a case like the computer club, we print a lot of checks because we're reimbursing people for things they buy for the club. Um, you can actually have quick and print the checks for you and then it keeps track. If you're gonna do that, you need to order check stock that's all printed with the bank account uh, routing number and account number and the check number. Um, you can get that for fairly nominal fee per check. And one key point, if you're gonna use quick and it wouldn't really matter any bookkeeping system, one of the realities is uh, it's an everyday job. If you let it sit for too long, it just totally gets away from you. It's, it's literally almost uh, every day you get checks in the mail, things show up, uh, the bank account. Um, so you've got to be pretty religious about keeping it up. Um, once you get behind, it's it really quickly turns into a chore. Okay, so far so good. So let's take a look at John and Mary Smith. And I just pulled these two uh, tables. There's one for income and one for expenses. So uh, they have a little bit of income. Uh, my model was John is a son. They're both Sun City seniors, by the way. So John actually works as a fitness monitor for the association. Uh, Mary runs a medical transcription business on her computer out of the house. So it doesn't matter exactly how that works. It's a, you know, a gig job kind of thing, but so they've got a little bit of income from that. They get their social security. They've got a B of CD at B of A. So some interest income, they get some dividends from their Schwab accounts. Uh, we'll demonstrate one stock sale when we get there. Uh, they get some pension money and they have IRAs. And 2020 uh, has been a rare year. Uh, the IRS waived all required minimum distributions. But in normal years, they would be taking those as uh, pension distributions from, the, from their IRAs. Now on the expense side, uh, because Mary's running a business, she's got a deduction uh, for this 20% of gross uh, income. That was legislated into law last year. They both have health insurance costs through Medicare Part B, some additional premiums to Humana for their, uh, John has a PPO, Mary's got an HMO. Uh, some healthcare expenses, they pay property tax on the house, long-term care insurance, car license fees, make some charitable donations, contributions, and then uh, this is more really related to tax, but they do qualified charitable donations from their IRIS. And when you go back, uh, here, I'll do it this way. Uh, you can take those out of the IRA RMDs up front. And those are still essentially deductible pre-tax. So you can still take your uh, standard deduction, but make charitable donations. Now, again, this isn't a tax seminar, so I don't have time to get way into that. Come back and see me in January is when I do the tax seminar. So, all right, let's, uh, we've talked a bit, let's dive in. We're gonna create a new Quicken database. Now, I'll, I'll demonstrate how to do that, but I'm not, other than just stepping through the basics. Uh, I've already got one set up and I don't want to re-enter all the stuff that I had to put in to make that. But 
I've got Quicken over here. And you can see I've already got John and Mary Smith open. But where we would go is File, New Quicken File. And uh, if I say, actually, I may not go any further than this. If I say, OK, it's going to ask me for the name of it and where to put it. And once you've done that, it'll it'll offer me the option to create accounts. But it's up to you. Do you want to see that, or have all of you done this already sometime in your life? Um, uh, can you have more than one quick and file open at a time? It doesn't seem like you can. You can't have more than one open. You can have many quick and files on your hard drive, and the way I I choose which one is I just use the file explorer and go open it. Actually, let me go ahead with this for a second, just so you can see. And just for the, I'll, I'll call this one, uh, just to give it a different name, test. All right, and say save. And now see, it goes through the gyrations. And at this point, I'm kind of into a, Sync to mobile and web. Uh, do you want to be able to see your stuff on your smartphone? I uh, unselected that because I don't really want my financial stuff going on my smartphone. Because then if I lose my smartphone and somebody else gets hold of it, it's all hanging out over there. Uh, but it's your choice. This is sort of a wizard, so I hit next. And let me narrow, I'm going to bring this window in just a bit so we can see better. All right, I'm ready to, so right away it says add account, and that'll take you into an add, add account wizard. Uh, I'll take you there once. Okay. So by default, the thing it's going to do is create a connected account. They've got like all your financial institutions there. Um, when you pick one of these, like your Discover, your Bank of America, any of these things, it's going to ask for your login credentials for that account. And then that'll immediately make it possible for it to go download the transactions. You can also choose offline account. And then you get some categories. So you can choose checking, savings, credit card, brokerage, you know, typical things. Or you can choose other assets and liabilities. So like your home, your car, your boat, <laughs> stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Non-cash assets, let's say you hold some very high value jewelry, you can pick those. Uh, liability accounts would be debts other than loans. Uh, I don't know if that's a mortgage or what, you know, it's, I haven't gone in and done that yet, but anyway, that's, I did all the accounts as offline accounts. Now, let me uh, real quick, I'll close quick and let me go back and uh, I'm going to reopen the one I already had. Uh, Quick in 2020. There we go. John and Mary Smith. There's the QDF file. And see, here's the new one that just got created. Just double click on that and click and opens right up in that database. And I'm back where I was. So that, uh, that basically now, this is a good point. We'll do a little tour here. Um, Here's the file menu. There's, you can go open quick and file and browse to one that way to save a copy. I don't know what that you can set a password on a particular file. Probably that's a good thing to do. Here's the backup and restore things. You can import files. Uh, QIF is the quick and import format. Uh, 
No. That's a good way if you're if you're taking data from one database, wanting to put it in another. Uh, you can export the same way. Here's uh, going to Joe's question. File operations on the file menu, year end file copy. Um, and something that says Zoom block. And here you can create a basically a, an old file, an archive file that has all the data, and then a new one in which you can specify what date at him. The rest is the uh, date before which transactions are, are not kept. Tom. So a common thing you would do is you might want to keep one year's history back. So then it's easy to look back and find a transaction uh, maybe that happened early last year that you need well, to go back and refer to. There's a calendar here so you can actually choose which date. And then it has been participants. And, but the main screen. Tom? Yeah. yeah. Can you ask everybody to, uh, to mute their microphone so we don't get the background noise? Yeah, we Please. Need, if you're going to talk, mute your microphone if you're going to talk offline, just so the other people don't hear you. Uh, appreciate that. I don't see how to do it. I'm still hearing, I think Greta, can you mute your microphone? I'm trying to find where to mute it. Lower left corner of your uh, Zoom window. In full screen, it's harder to do. Can you see the on the right side, there should be a, a little stack of, of images. You can go and maybe I can do it for you. Let's see there. Okay, I muted you, Greta. You can unmute yourself by just pressing the space bar if you want to say something. Okay, let's continue. That's better. Sorry. Anyway, you can set the date here. And what will happen is then the, the result of this will just have transactions uh, on or after January 1st of 2019. And everything prior to that uh, will have been removed. It does note unreconciled transactions will still be kept. Let's see, which are not, yeah. All right, you can specify where that archive copies to go to. And so that's the process. Now, again, I haven't tried it yet. But if you're feeling brave, go give it a shot. So again, it was file, file operations, year end copy. Note too, if you're, uh, every once in a while the database gets corrupt, you can go to validate and repair. There's printer set up, there's check printing. So a lot of stuff here. It does keep track of recent databases you've used. So this is another way to go to a particular one, if you're bouncing between two or three. All right, the edit menu is pretty typical. View menu has a lot of stuff you can fiddle with. Uh, tools, you can bring up the account list. You can, you can do add account here if you want. There's a calendar, uh, a lot of stuff going on in here. And mobile and web, again, I'm not doing anything with right now, but you can go there. And then the reports menu, I'm going to come back to that. And there's a lot of help, a getting started guide. There's uh, some tips and tutorials. You can go get support. There's a, an online forum. You can ask questions. Um, and on and on and on. And if you go to the help, you can do the specific things. Right, thank you. Also about Quicken, you might wanna check this once in a while and see what version you're running. So we're on Quicken 2020 version R30 and the build number. So 
Uh, if you're a subscriber, Quicken uh, quite frequently updates itself. And in fact, when I started it up, the first thing I, I got an update this morning with some new features. Okay, let me come back here for a second. A um, couple of points. Uh, Quicken by default, whenever you start, it goes to the last database you had open. Um, most personal users are going to just have one and keep all their accounts in that one database. But as we said, you can have any number of them set up. But I haven't found any way to get Quicken to actually open two different ones at the same time. Um, possibly Windows has some fairly fancy desktop features now. Possibly if you take advantage of that, there might be a way. You want the computer? Yeah. yeah. So once you get your Quicken database itself set up, the next thing is you've got to set up your chart of accounts. And uh, we'll go do that in a second. But let me make my points here. Let's go to the beginning. So yeah. There is an account list on the left side of the main Quicken window. There's a plus icon up there. Uh, you can just click that to add a new account, and then you'll get into a, a series of dialogues that ask you questions again, which we, we saw. Um, the various types, though, you've got things that are cash flow, like your savings, checking, credit cards, actual cash versus investments. And then you've got property and debt type accounts, your house, your car, your mortgage. So some examples of B of A checking, first mortgage, and so on. Uh, as you're setting them up, as we noted, you can indicate whether they're linked to your provider's online servers. If you make it an offline account, it works the same, but then you have to type all the information in yourself. Uh, for something like your house, that's maybe a better way to do it. Uh, anyway, once you set the, you create the account, you set its properties, like whether it's tax linked and stuff, uh, set its initial balance. Uh, for the investment accounts, you need to go put in what's there, you know, uh, stocks you hold, uh, things like that. And uh, the interface for entering those is fairly simple. All right, so let's go back. And uh, I haven't done anything recalling that Fred and Mary have uh, jobs, sort of. One, one account we might want to add, it's actually, it's more of a category. The cash is going to flow into their checking account. Um, but let's just for the sake of it, they, uh, let's add another credit card. Most people more have more than one. And again, because I can't link it to online. Here's a credit card. Uh, they already had a Southwest visa. Why don't we do a Discover? Um, notice I just typed the name in. If there were two Discovers, you might name them more explicitly. But in, in this case, we enter the ending date and balance from your last statement. So. This would more likely have been, oh, 10, 30, something like that. And let's say their balance on it was 256, 18. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. And that's done. So now we see discover over in the account list here. Now you notice these highlight when, it, when I put something on them. Uh, let's take a look at the South. So this one I actually had entered in a few 
uh, synthetic charges. Opening balance was that uh, they've, they've shopped at Smith's, they had carry out from Buka, the Beppo, bought some stuff at Amazon. Um, now again, ideally you'd want to be downloading this stuff, but let's say we, uh, we have another transaction. Uh, click the calendar, maybe it happened on uh, November 10th. Uh, and who might we have charged? Maybe they went over to Albertsons. Grocery. Okay, and it might have been, uh, yeah, let's just say weekly groceries again. So when you get to the category, you notice this was a memo I just typed. We drop down the category list and it's, it's in the broad sense of personal expenses. If you scroll down here, we'll find Maybe I went by food and dining. Okay, groceries. So food and dining is a main category. Groceries is a subcategory. Uh, Tom? We, yeah. How do you enter and save a category? Uh, it's your, pardon me, wife's phone's ringing. Um, <laughs> There's a place to do it. I'll, I'm going to come to it in a minute, but okay. uh, actually, I think this little now oh, that's an attachment. I'm sorry. Uh, I think back here, uh, look right down at the bottom of this as I'm adding. If if the category I want is not in the list, you can say new category right here. Okay. You see that? Got it. Um, and okay. it generally at the beginning, you may run into that where you, you want finer tracking than and what Quicken's default has or something. But it's easy to just hit that, type it in, and then it, it brings up another dialogue. Um, and you delete categories. I you show full list. I, you see if I can remember where people always ask me questions I can't answer. <laughs> yeah, I right clicked on it. You can delete it or you can hide it. Okay. okay. I'd yeah. recommend more than more often because if you've ever used that category, you probably don't want to delete it. But if you did, didn't use it, it'll tell you it's unused and then you could go ahead. You could delete it. Yeah. All right, I'm going to hit done. Tom, that, that's pretty much equivalent to like the chart of accounts in QuickBooks. Uh, pretty close. The categories would be uh, the opposite. You know, cash comes into the checking account, or in this case, we're essentially on the credit card. Uh, this would most likely have been paid by a credit card. Uh, you always need an offset. You've got cash in, and then what was it? What account did that cash go to or, or get get accounted to? Let me, let me just put in a number again. I'll put in 8325 just to have something. All right, and then you can hit the little green save icon, or you can just press the enter key. Um, so again, this is on the credit card. And what's really going on is you're, you're getting a short-term loan from Southwest Visa, the cash flow to Albertsons. Eventually you're gonna get a bill and you're gonna pay that from the checking account. Um, so yeah, the categories are, are equivalent to uh, uh, expense accounts. 
You have income, expense, assets, and liabilities, basically. This 8325 uh, becomes a liability in the sense that the, we now owe Southwest Visa another 8325. You can see our balance on that card right now is 5316. Now, at some point, the bill comes. And presumably then from B of A checking, they write a check or do an online payment to Southwest Visa. Uh, that makes the balance go to zero over here and money comes out of the checking account accordingly. So it, it all balances out the same way. Conceptually, it isn't as visible as a classical dual entry booking system, which is what QuickBooks does. Um, fairly, fair bit easier though. All right, let me see if we want to do anything else. That was, uh, when you're done with an account, you can just close it back up like that. Um, let's go look at their Schwab trust account. I think that's where I had the, no, wrong one. Let me look in. John's IRA. Yeah, he owns the preferred stock ETF, 500 shares. Okay, so I had indicated John, uh, he had bought this preferred stock ETF, it symbols PFF, uh, May 16th of 2014. So it's gone up a good bit in value. He's uh, decided to take profits on that for whatever reason. So once again, you start, we have uh, the date that the transaction occurred. And let's say it was on the 17th. The action drop down gives you a choice of things. You see, these are related to what you would do at a brokerage. So in his case, it was uh, pretty straightforward. He sold, tab over. The security, you can drop down and the list is there. So that was, uh, you go over how many shares he sold the whole lot, 500. Sold it for a price of 47.19 per share. This is a wonderful era. The commission and fees were zero. So cash amount, would be that, okay. Yeah. That would be right, okay. And then enter. All right, so if we look, the net effect on that then, his holdings in that uh, security PFF, his share balance has now gone to zero. He realized 23,595 in cash. His cash balance has increased by that amount to a total of 44,345. Uh, cash balance in the account is that. Total market value of the account is based on yesterday's prices, 186.911. Now, actions, you can actually at this point, if you want to get the latest quotes, just choose update quotes only. Once again, if this account were electronically linked to John's IRA, you could download all the transactions from Schwab in this case. But let's go ahead, it's uh, the update quotes is connecting to some servers that Quicken uses. All right. And let me close that and open it back up. All right, there's what I was looking for. So based on today's pricing, I can't remember if it's up or down. Um, 
but you can actually track your portfolio fairly well this way. There's also, uh, for investing accounts, you can come over, there's a tab here. And this kind of gives you a complete view of all of that for each of your various accounts, what your holdings are, the current price, the shares, the market value. Uh, I think I, yeah, here's the stretch, your gain loss and some various other things. So it's actually working like a portfolio tracker. Um, that's interesting too. I don't recall putting anything in the watch list. Maybe, maybe I did. Um, they also give you some general market information. What's what's going on with the Dow, the Nasdaq, and so on. So that's fairly nice. Let's take a look. Um, Come back to the home screen for a second. Down here on, again, in this account list, way at the bottom, I didn't call this out. You get a readout of your total net worth, 891,618 for John and Mary. And that's a mix of their investing, their savings. Uh, they actually went out at some time and bought uh, some Kruger ants. Uh, about what would that be at 1800 here we can click that how many have they got uh gold one ounce Kruger hands i guess it's just in cash the current price is uh about a little under 1900 1850 1875 so i think i when i did the math on this it was uh 15 Krugerians, something in that range. Anyway, here's a, an, an asset account, but it's not in the brokerage. They've literally got the, the Krugerians in their safe deposit box or buried in the backyard somewhere where hopefully the burglars won't find it. Um, and then they've got the, the home. And right now that's a pretty simple entry. Uh, it was bought back in 2002. Uh, looks remarkably like my house. Um, they, uh, here I got a, there. It's funny these columns don't adjust well, but there you can kind of see. So increase 235, market appreciation. All right, so uh, they bought it at 235. It's gone up in value about 120 in the last 18 years. That's pretty typical Sun City. So currently that house would market for 356. And uh, one way to find out what your home is worth, uh, better than looking at the real estate flyers that come by is go to Zillow <laughs> and look at some comps there just to get a general sense. But it's pretty hard to nail down on homes exactly what fair market value is. Uh, if somebody across the street with the same house sold theirs, you can look that up and find out what it was worth. Now, something you might do in here as a transaction, uh, Let's, I'll pick October 13th of this year. And this would have been paid maybe, uh, we'll just, I'll make up a fictitious company, Chicken Re, Kitchen Remodelers, okay. Okay. Uh, maybe new cabinets. Why don't we say new kitchen cabinets? All right, category, let's see what we got here. I haven't, I'm making this up on the fly. 
home, home improvement probably would do it. Okay. Let me fix my memo so it's easier to read. All right. And uh, this might have been oh, 18.5. All right. Now the question is, should it be a decrease or an increase? I think I, I should take it out of there and put it in as an increase. All right, let's see if that worked right. Yep. So the idea is when you make a major capital improvement to your home, you want to journal it in so that you see that as an increase in the value of the house. You would add this to the basis of the house for tax purposes. Now for a personal home, where this comes into play is uh, you sell the house you would actually be showing a profit relative to the original cost of about 138,000. That's not that big. It would not be taxable because you get the exclusion of half a million dollars. But let's say your house were quite a bit more expensive to begin with and has appreciated. Anyway, you don't want them taxing home improvements that you added and paid for as appreciation on the house. Okay, let me go back to my slides. So we've kind of demoed uh, entering, we've already done some transactions. Uh, categories we were sort of indicating, where these are mainly used is in the reports and the tax summaries. The categories can have subcategories and let me ask the expert, can you have sub subcategories? <laughs> You're going to have multiple levels. So for really complicated things, some of the medical expense stuff gets like that because uh, you might want a category for doctors and then a subcategory for each individual doctor you see. Uh, labs are separate, prescriptions are separate, eyeglasses are separate. So you can get into quite a lot of categories there. Virtually all of that's tax deductible. As you've seen, there's a pretty large category list built in. Uh, you can also go up here, the tools menu. Uh, category list, and this gets us back to, we saw this sort of pop up when we, so here it all is with a little bit more narrative information. And you can see if it's a tax line item, uh, where it goes. So you can browse through this and, um, uh, now well, let's see. Just for grants, let's know. It's fairly easy to say new category again. So why don't we try just for, because uh, Jeff's here, he would be into this streaming services. Okay. It's an expense category. Actually, it's a subcategory of and we can find uh, entertainment. Okay, why don't we just make it a subcategory of entertainment and uh, online streaming. So then when we pay the Netflix bill every month, we can put it into Quicken under the category streaming services. And then when you run your reports to say, how much am I spending on streaming services? That'll all roll up under that category. 
All right, so there's an example of entering a new category for yourself. And on down, food and dining, uh, fast food, restaurants, hard to say, gifts and donations. Uh, let's see what they've got under medical, or was that under health? Health and fitness. Let's uh, let's do a new category there because uh, lab, huh? No, it's going to ask me what subcategory. Wouldn't be under dentist, no. I see. All right. You're, they can't hear you. So I'm just going to make this under health and fitness uh, lab tests. And uh, uh, I don't know if I need much of a description. Uh, routine lab tests. Does not affect investment performance. All right. Now you notice, uh, let me right click on this since, nope, that's not where I wanna go. Where's the trick to make it taxable? I thought, thought that dropped out automatically to ask you. I thought it when it came to put it in. Here it is. Now let me, I think if you want to edit one, just double. No, what do I do? Right click edit. Okay. Uh, tax reporting. There's a separate tab. Sorry, I missed that. So this is a tax related category. What tax line would it go under? Uh, let's. It's going to be on Schedule A. And doctors, dentists, hospitals. Medicine and drugs. They don't really have a category separate for labs. I guess that's the closest I can get. All right. <clears throat> I don't want to beat that to death too much. So that's kind of uh, working on your category list. And so you can go wild with this if you want to. I think it's kind of a trade off between the level of detail you need uh, to make it easy in your reports to sort of understand what, what important things are happening. And the tax tagging is important because um, I'll show you when we get to reports. One of the reports is a tax summary. And if you haven't marked one of these lines as a tax line item, it doesn't show up in the tax report. So let me close the category list. All right. So we entered some cash flow transactions. Uh, by the way, I, I didn't do it. Don't really necessarily recommend it, but. When you do a transaction, if you've got the PDF, let's say of the invoice, you can attach that to the transaction and Quicken will actually, you then browse to that PDF. Quicken will make a copy of that into uh, the Quicken database. And uh, then you can go back, when you look at that transaction, you can look at the attached document as well. And let's see, you go to spending. I'm, I'm just showing you, these are some of the quick views you can get in Quicken itself. Like here are spending transactions and it hasn't been very long. They, all, they build up quick. Um, 
So you can look at these. Uh, you can actually edit them right here, which is kind of handy if you see, particularly when you're reconciling, you look at what's going on recently and you see something. Um, you've got some filters up here. Like right now I'm looking at all accounts. I could say, just show me all the credit cards. And that would limit it down to uh, just the two credit cards. And really all the charges are on one. Or maybe you want uh, all checking accounts, wh whatever it is. And you can specify a range, full year, 90, whatever you want. Let's. Uh, for me, everything's been pretty recent, but I could say, give me the last two months. Um, spending, spending without taxes, income. Haven't really seen, oh, there's some social security income for John and Mary, I put that in. Yeah, that's cool. Let's, uh, that's funny, well, all right, let me go to the home. Why don't we uh, go back to the checking account? Let's put in one more. Uh, it's payday for John. Every two weeks, Sun City pays their employees. So what was, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I've got a calendar right here. So uh, would have been the 13th, all right? Last Friday, John got paid. Uh, and probably this came in as an electronic funds transfer because John has his bank account on file. Uh, payee, um, payee would be who you wrote the check to. So I don't think I would put anything in there. Memo would be Sun City, let's say John, S C S C A I wages. How's that? Category. Uh, let's hunt up. Is there a salary category here? Or wages? No. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Here we go. Uh, do, 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 do. Net salary, other income. Okay. And uh, John's getting a bit more than minimum wage, let's say about uh, nine bucks an hour or so. For a week, that would be 20 hours times 180 bucks. And what happened to my entry? It went away. Now, I don't see anything back here. That's odd. I, I didn't. I, okay. Or, or the, the payee equals to. Let's do it again. The uh, So you, even though it's not a payee, you put it in. All right, we'll try that. Uh, John. That's the payer. Okay, personal income, net salary. All right, so that's the category. Payment was 180. That's better. Uh, somehow, let's save it. Now, here it is. Yeah. So there's that transaction. And the only thing that would be interesting here is how do you account for the taxes withheld and the stuff like that? 
Um, yeah, Tom, I know in, in like in QuickBooks, uh, for there's a separate deposit screen and you you put uh, pieces of the deposit in, in the subcategories like taxes right. and yeah. social security. So that's security. what I'm talking about here. It would be sort of a split transaction. Yeah. 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 Um, what I was looking for, I think more actions. Yeah, here's where I'd go split. Okay, so net salary 180. Um, that's fine. Let me, uh, now I think I can just type, let's see what my choice is. <clears throat> Say what? So, uh, well, I think there's probably a category already under, uh, let's look under taxes. Federal tax withheld. Okay, so the amount might have been, let's say, 18 bucks. And let's see if they withheld FICA. No. So I might need to say uh, Medicare. Want to create a new category? Yeah. And then you have to do that. All right, and it's a subcategory. Of, you see, the first few times you do this, it can be a little tedious. Um, what? Oh. I'll just say it's a sub, it's tax, and this is re, well, actually, you don't get to deduct those. No. So probably don't report it on the tax report. All right, I'll just save it. Tax Medicare. And uh, the amount on that wouldn't be 18, it would be about five bucks, it doesn't matter. All right, you get the idea. So now... <clears throat> Tom, that, yeah, go ahead. Question. While you're on the checking account, uh, we tend to write uh, the same checks to the same people. I noticed when uh, we go to enter the payee, we type the first initial of some names that come right up. It will come back, yeah. Yeah, and then with some names that don't, is there a, is there a way you have to save a name? Because I write a check to this in one lady, and I have to write her name in every time. Uh -huh. It doesn't pop up. That's strange. Yeah. Well, here we're in the checking account. Let's say we write uh, next check number. It automatically keeps track, so it's eleven twenty one. <clears throat> and see, when I get to here, I get a drop down of everybody I've written checks to already. Right. right. This so it, it, it's not remembering. Yeah, it's kind of odd. Uh, let's. Um, yeah, we do. I don't do the drop. Oh. Maybe that's. we'll make up somebody again. Station casinos. Do you have to do the drop down, or should you just be able to? Oh, no, you can type. I just typed in a new one. That's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, memo. Um, Oh, what, what what would I pay station for? Yeah. Losses. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, yeah. We don't have to. But it's wise to do so. Otherwise, you don't know what the heck it was. It was a personal expense. I don't know that they have a category for gambling. Mm -hmm. uh, we can type one in. What the heck? All right, yeah, create that category. It's an expense category. It's not a subcategory, okay. And the amount might have been, maybe he was at the uh, sports book. <clears throat> well, I don't really know if they take checks. 
Okay. Okay. Now the question is, if I come over here, um, Station Casinos is now in my list. Okay, now, before you did the drop down, if you just hit an S. Well, see, when I, when I tab into the field, it drops down automatically. Okay. But now type in the If I click here and type S T, see it'll find it as a match. Uh, but it's okay. So, so either you way. Have, yeah. So you have huge, it, right. right. <clears throat> so it does it's, it's in the memorized pay list though. So you may there may be a place to put it into the memorized pay list. That could well be. That's what I was looking for, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to hit escape and cancel that transaction. Okay. All right, that answered my question. Yeah. All right. It, I mean, it's there. Mm -hmm. Typically, look under tools, memorized payee list. There it is. So it's just like your categories in your accounts, you can bring them up. So here you can add new payee, various options, merge. Sometimes you get the same person in there more than once under different, slightly different names. Yeah, all right. That kind all of right. thing. Right. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, so anyway, so we did a split transaction just in the course of what we were doing. Let's see what else we've got here. Uh, showed you the filters. So we've kind of done this. I showed you the downloading the price quotes. Um, let me go back though. Another way to do that is click on the investing tab. We were there before. And up here, you've got some gadgets uh, update and you can say quotes, historical prices. That'll take you, if you need to know what did I pay for that stock and you bought it 10 years ago, uh, you may not have the data ready to hand. You can go look it up and at least get close, you know, so that if the IRS for some reason decides it doesn't agree with your capital gain calculations. Um, anyway, there's some tools there, asset allocation guides, stuff like that and a variety of reports you can pull. Fairly nice stuff. This is good too, if you buy bonds or CDs, it'll keep track of the maturity dates. That can be handy. So that's in there. Um, again, I talk about the transaction downloading. Once in a while, um, you may need your brokerage company to help you uh, set it up so you can download it and quicken. Um, you need a user ID and password, but usually you have that on the accounts. Um, once in a while, uh, I don't think this is much true today, but it used to be sometimes you'd have to download the transactions yourself into a file and then import them into Quicken because not all the providers like the idea of having a uh, third-party service connecting to the account on your behalf, basically, and, and downloading that data. There were concerns about security. Uh, all right, we kind of beat that to death. And uh, we did a sell, why don't we go do a buy? Here again, we'll go to their trust account. Pull that over. Now, again, I put, when I set these up, I put a cash balance in. And then we bought some stocks using that cash balance. Right now, the cash balance is about 10,000. And you could, re, you know, you can go down to your brokerage and write a check and put more cash in. Most of the brokerages these days let you link your brokerage account to a bank account. TD Ameritrade, I know, does that, and uh, 
so I can transfer funds from B of A checking directly into my trust account on uh, TD Ameritrade. And every now and then, you know, the electronic fund transfers just keep flowing into the checking account. After a while, it gets to be pretty full. Then I move the money over into the uh, brokerage account so I can buy stocks or bonds or ETFs and get some interest. Because the money sitting in the B of A checking account is actually earning negative at this point. The, uh, the interest rate is about less than a tenth of a percent, probably 0 0.05. But anyway, just for the sake of it, we can buy something. Uh, so it's again, it's today. Let's go buy. And now as far as what, um, oh, I don't know. What, Maybe I'm really excited finally about, uh, I blanked on the name, <laughs> Elon Musk's, what's, what's the stupid electric car? No help. You've been helping me all morning and now I need you and you do. Can't remember, huh? Never mind. we'll buy General Motors. Buy American, right? So you just type the symbol, you can click that and it, now it went out and got some data. Okay, click next. All right, now the, the thing is, it got that much. How many shares did I buy? And GM's been trading around 35. I could probably buy 100 shares of that. I don't really know what it's trading for today. Zero commission. All right. Let's say enter. There we are. So my cash balance. I want to. I don't want to have another one. It's funny that that vanished from the screen when I put that in. But let me close this and open it back up again. I don't know if that's a bug or if it's just something it does. Yes, I can, I know. We'll do that in a second. So cash balance is now down to 71. I spent 3,500 for 10, 100 shares of General Motors. Uh, all cool. Uh, my helper back here says, you can go to the holdings view and see all your holdings in that account. That might be handy. Um, and General Motors, my cost basis is whatever it is. Now to see, once again, I can, in this account, I can go, no, nope, it's wrong place. Let me go here. Let me update the quotes again real fast. And the price on GM is actually 4231. So buying it for 35 is kind of a not not quite what I should have. Anyway, you can click on it and you also can bring up a detail view. This is kind of nice. There's the chart. That's the one year chart for GM. Uh, current what it is and uh, how many shares. So that's kind of handy to have. Well, anyway, that's entering uh, a transaction for an asset. Uh, if you're entering a bunch of this stuff and I'll, I'll cite a case, uh, you might buy, uh, particularly if you buy a larger block, uh, your brokerage, will, and it's true if you execute at market too, because you're not specifying a price. Uh, your broker may break your request to buy 500 shares into a bunch of little blocks. And this happens because the computer matches up buy and sell orders at the brokerage house. 
without ever going out to the uh, stock exchange floor. Because at any given instant, you've got many, many people buying and selling the same stock at the same time. And so they pair those up. But I just did one where I got 200 shares, then 100, then another 100, then 70. And that completed my order. But those all went at slightly different prices. Uh, 69 and a half, you know, the, the dollars were the same, but the cents were 69.5 cents, 70.1 cents. So now you've got all these little lots that were bought at different prices. And probably the IRS wouldn't really care. You could just average it and say, I bought uh, 570 shares at such and so price. But uh, if you download that, all those little individual transactions are going to come in anyway. Um, the other thing you'll see, and again, I, I don't think I'll try to enter it in these brokerage accounts, though. Oops, there it is again. Uh, if you own uh, very many particularly exchange traded funds, a lot of them pay dividends by the month. You're just gonna see a slew of dividend income transactions. Uh, when you download those, they show up as underscore div inc. Now they add to the cash balance of the account. Um, and the brokerage keeps track of all those. When you get the uh, year end 1099 statements, they tell you all the dividend income you earned. Uh, that's in your taxable account, whatever. It might be a trust, it might be a personal. Okay, that was asset transactions. Let's talk a little. Reconciling is where you look at what your quick and accounts say and uh, probably the best view to start with is over here but let's say you you get the statement from b of a you look at the balance you compare that you can go in here and uh, what you want to happen is that the data in your quick and agrees, you see the same transactions, the balances agree. And obviously you've always got the thing, if you've written a check that hasn't cleared yet, you know about the check, but the bank doesn't. And uh, if you've made a deposit after the date of the statement, you know about the deposit, but the, the bank the bank knows it's there, but the statement doesn't reflect it. So you have to make slight adjustments for outstanding checks and deposits. Um, credit card accounts. Like here's the Discover had nothing, pardon me. Let's go back to the uh, Southwest Visa. I had a few things on there. So again, you get that statement. You want to check and make sure everything in your Quicken is present on the statement, does the balance owed agree? If you've made a payment, is that reflected and so on? So reconciling is really a kind of auditing of what the financial provider thinks is true as compared to what your Quicken accounts say. And when you have a discrepancy, now you've got to figure out, <laughs> was it me or was it them? with the high probability being it's you, um, but not always. You also want, as you're doing that, to be monitoring those, particularly the credit card transactions. Is anything in there that you didn't do? And they do turn up every now and then where somebody's 
uh, latched on to your credit card number and your name and the, the information they need to do online charges. That's still always one of the gotchas of you go to a restaurant and pay with your credit card. The waitress takes it away and runs it and brings it back. You never know if they didn't run it uh, and capture that information. These days, they don't even need to run it with a cell phone. They just take a picture of the front and back of the card and they've got it all. You know, so, but be that as it may, uh, it's something you have to do when the statements come in every month. You want to make sure you keep keep everything up to date. All right, and then let's we got just about enough time. Let's look at the graphs and the reports for a minute or so. Uh, go back here. Uh, here's reports. Now there's a reports and graphs center. Then there's some specific categories here you can run. Cap gains, things like that. Um, let's see. What I wanted was net worth and now I'm not seeing it here. Well, let's do the tax summary. This is one, if not you, your accountant will be very pleased if you, you can provide this. Now, th this is uh, not nearly as detailed as a real one would be because I've got so few transactions. But like I said, we put uh, John's wages in today and his social. Actually, uh, current year. Okay, all right. What happened to John's wages from Sun City? I see their social uh, security. I thought I maybe I didn't. Good question. Well, we see anyway, so far their social security income for each of them, the total for the year. And when you're putting this information into your tax return, they want the data for John and the data for Mary separate. And then there are other things. It's down where that's the uh, tax withheld, but I don't see his wages, I mean. So I didn't mark that taxable income. See, there's a because I made it scasky wages. Oh, okay. Anyway, it just to demonstrate when you're doing this on the fly, you may not get it all right the first time. Something that's the view. You pull a report and say, wait a minute, where's John's wages? Oops, I forgot to set that category up correctly. Um, all right, that's one. Let me try this um, reports and graphs center. Okay, net worth and balances, there we go. I can open that up. Uh, as of, all right, let's just say show report. So there it is. So their net worth, uh, and I mean, this is something you could print out or uh, what I like to do a lot now is I use the Microsoft print to PDF. So I'll print this and save it. Uh, I think the export may let you do that directly, but one way or the other, it's nice instead of having piles and piles of paper, you can print these as PDFs or export them as PDFs, put them in a folder on your hard drive, make sure you back that up. But then 
then these are easy to search and you can look through them real fast. Uh, if you're trying to find something. Uh, yeah. Well, now if I click with the little, you notice that turned into a plus there. If I double click that, I can get yeah. to that account and the transactions. Yeah. So when you're looking at the reports, you can actually drill in to the specifics of that account that's being summarized in the reports. So there's where John bought the Krugerrands. All right, so that's the net worth report. Uh, if I go back another level, let's look at the account balances report. And these are two you would, just in terms of tracking what you're doing, these are fairly handy. Uh, all right. Let's see what, what happens when I say show graph. <laughs> Not very interesting because I've only got one month of data. So it colors them in. If you like colored bar graphs, there you go. Um, and that's the total balance in that account and oh, investment accounts, asset accounts, bank accounts. Okay. So it tells you this is your net worth here then. All right. So that's kind of a, a real quick look at reports and graphs. And I think I've actually just about hit it. Ah, backing up. Now, I'm going to come back out here. When I first set the Quicken database up, I chose a folder on my C drive, named it Quicken underscore 2020. It could be any name. And then under that, I've got a folder for John and Mary Smith. Um, Conceivably, let's let's say I was uh, a little younger and doing the bookkeeping for my parents. Uh, I might have Quicken database for our family, and then for mom and dad, or something like that. Or maybe uh, maybe your kids have prevailed upon you to keep their books for them. God help you if if they did that, but. But anyway, the database files, you're, you'll find there are actually uh, three, a QDF file, a DAT file with FX log in front of it, and then a sync log. Those are the three that Quicken creates. And the easiest way to back stuff up, go to the folder where they are, right click, copy, and then choose someplace, uh, probably a flash drive would be the most reasonable thing, but you can copy them to any place. Uh, just to demonstrate, here's a file. Uh, my wife's machine is on the same network. Um, and I'll make a folder here just I'm just going to call it backup. Go in there. Now I right click and paste. So this is doing the whole thing completely outside of Quicken, just with uh, Windows file copy and paste. But now I've got a backup over on Irene's machine uh, that's separate from the copies on my machine. And uh, if I were going to do this on a regular basis, I'd probably build a little command file, double click that, and it would just make the copy that way. So I don't have to do all this uh, clicking around. Now, Quicken has its own backup mechanisms. And let's go back to. Uh,
I didn't really show you this, but on preferences, I think that's where this was. No, uh, sorry. Oh, I my here's my problem. I'm I'm wrong program. Okay, file. Let's see a file operations. Back up and restore. Here we go. Okay, so off the file menu, you can back up a Quicken file explicitly. Here you can choose the name and where you want it to go. Uh, but we you know, set that up. If you want to change what it's, see, and it remembers to. All right. You can choose this checkbox for add the date. That's a good thing to do because every time you uh, open one of these files, the actual file access modified date gets changed. This tells you when the data in that file was actually saved. I'll hit back up now. Doesn't take it very long. All right, so that's done. And if you don't want it to tell you that all the time, you can say, don't show again. All right. Now, the other thing is Quicken when you exit will, based on settings, occasionally make a backup automatically for you. And that's what I was trying to get to with edit preferences. But I was, I was in the wrong program, the backup preferences. So over here, you can say, do you want automatic backups at all? You might prefer to do it the way I did it. Uh, if you have mine, you can say back up after running Quicken a certain number of times. And so maybe every five times you run it, uh, you might want to back up. Maximum number of backup copies to keep. And uh, that can be whatever you want to. Maybe three. Uh, you can also tell it to prompt you after a certain number of runs of Quicken to do a backup. Now, if you've got automatic on, I don't know that you need that. You might. So what will start to happen is if you don't manage this a little bit, you go check the backup folder and there's dozens and dozens of backup copies of your Quicken database. And within a, a week or two, the old backups are not something you'd probably want to restore because they're so out of date. Uh, the thing I did where I manually made a copy is good if you want to take a snapshot, say, as of the end of the month. Um, but even then, they're, they're more just in case something really gets messed up or you need to go back, you're trying to track down some arcane issue, uh, you can't get something to balance, you may want to go look and say, what did the balance look like a month ago, as opposed to today? And that, that sort of lets you narrow in on where whatever the problem is got into the data. Okay, anyway. Uh, last opportunity for questions. Let me stop sharing. Uh, how many have stayed with us? We've got eight left. Huh? <laughs> so, any of you have questions? This would be a time to unmute your microphones. Uh, Tom, I... Uh... Oh, okay. When I uh, at, I'm on the investment uh, page, the uh, the list of accounts uh, at uh, on the sidebar uh, will total uh, each account. Shows the total amount of each account and then mm -hmm. adds them all up for a figure. 
when I open the uh, breakdown of those accounts, the, the screen that shows the breakdown of all the accounts and what, what is in it, the totals on that screen are very, very different than the ones in the condensed uh, totals on the uh, sidebar. And I, I don't, I've never understood why that is. Have you encountered anything like that before? Uh, let me ask Irene here. I'm going to turn off my virtual background real quick. Well, let's see if we can, uh, there's none. Okay. That's just so she's back there helping me. And uh, let me, let me pull quick enough and then I'll, I'll go. Let me go back to sharing the screen. I guess I can't pull it up before I share. Can I? Where did all these windows come from? Okay, share. Quicken has done a lot of strange things over my years of experience, yeah. and that's just one of them. But that this total, this total on the account screen on the left. Right. Uh. Op yeah. Open the. Uh, uh, on the toolbar up above the fourth from the right. No, no, here. Well, not investing. Yeah, uh, I, I, I always use the toolbar at the top. So I, yeah, okay, shoot. So go to the, tools. Yeah, Where that one just below, to? just below. No, just below. No, the the toolbar below the. Oh. This thing. There you go. There you go. That one. That one. No, that's one that's the update. that's the update. No, no, no. Click that. Preferences. No, the one to the uh, right. Uh, see, I don't have you. it on my toolbar. Yeah, you don't have it. How, how do you open the breakdown of all of the uh, accounts? Uh, well, if I go tools account list, does that look like what you get or? No, 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 no. I want to, I want the breakdown of, of each uh, is each item in each account. All right, so like yeah. a. Let me try this investing tab. Does that look more like it? There you go. There you go. Yeah, the investing now that, tab. Yeah, the market value here is what? You got 437000 That's for all of the accounts, right? Yeah, and you should. You don't have a total over on the uh, drop down, though, for some reason. I have a total on that there? side as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, and, and it's I've got it right here. Investing four thirty seven six eighty three. Yeah, they're the same. All right, they match. Uh, mine and it is vastly different. I mean, uh, I mean, like twenty or thirty percent different. Yeah, uh, and it has been for it has been for years. I don't. Uh, I just don't pay any attention. That's strange. I don't pay any attention to those numbers. Uh, the the main the main screen there uh, on mine is fairly accurate, so that's all I ever rely on. But I just wondered if anybody else had it. Do your do your individual accounts? If you if you go go into Schwab Trust account. Go into what? Yeah. Yeah, she's she's pointing her finger, which. Oh. Anyway. Does that amount? Agree with the other. Yeah, account. when you when you look in the individual account, when you look at the oh, I've never, value. I've never, uh, I've never really tried to compare those before because uh, that's just a screen I don't look at. Well, I'll tell you one thing that I do when I when I reconcile in it as the investment account at the end of the month, they never really really agree, so I look at it and I say, okay, when did I uh, last download? Uh, did 
was there a great big change in the uh, amount of the stock the 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 share you know how much you pay and if my statement and my quicken are within a thousand or so I don't worry about it because you can never get the same amount as your statement because oh, no I realize that I realize yeah I, I understand that well, and, and uh, the problem another thing that the uh, the market value of each stock is changing constantly. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there there are variables that you're you're never going to reconcile perfectly. Uh, but it should be within a couple of percentage points. Yeah, I'm, I'm right. talking about well, yeah. when much I more see ten thousand, then I start asking Tom what he did. Yeah, it's <laughs> considerably I, more than that. I don't know about it. Well, yeah. see, she only you know, okay. downloads at the end of the month. So, so something else that mine does periodically when I uh, uh, when I will ch check the uh, uh, the investments, it will uh, come up with uh, if I have say four hundred shares of a given issue, uh, all of a sudden by itself it will show. 399.7621 shares hmm. and i and i i have to enter those fractional that one fractional share difference to bring it back to where it belongs hmm. that seems so, weird. I've never had that. yeah i don't know what that you've about. never had that yeah i don't either it's well it's great. that's not I, I basically turned off any and all dividend reinvestment program stuff in the brokerage accounts because that's how you get these micro fractional shares all the time. Yeah, I know. I never, I yeah. never do that either. I read that either. Uh, anyway, I, it's, all right, it, well, Quicken is valuable, but it does strange things in, in my experience. Okay, thanks. Well, every now and then, it's uh, like you were asking me about uh, doing that year-end close thing. Uh, make a copy of your database first and then try that. Uh, sometimes I think cleaning out a lot of the old transactions may just help the thing. It, what you're really doing then is rewriting the entire database and uh if you've got any little incipient corruption in the indexes or anything like that that may clear it up uh, yeah well, I, I that's kind of the conclusion i came to that's why i've been interested in getting 20 20 years of it out, well, of, out of the way i'm thinking of trying that with ours just to see what happens uh because okay all right well, I think it's uh, probably uh, most everybody's gone away. Why don't we call it a day? I uh, hope this was Very helpful to, to the three that are left. Nobody seemed uh, too offended by it anyway. All right. No, I mean, that was it was fine, Tom. I appreciate it. Thank you much. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and okay. end the session. We'll see you soon. See you soon. Take care. Bye.